For a few years, I've worked as a private contractor. My grandfather taught me to be a woodworker and carpenter. Grandma used to say I could properly use a dowel before I could talk, but I think they might have exaggerated a bit. Still, I love making things with my hands. That passion has given me quite a lot over the years. A family, a home, a steady job, a 68 Dodge Charger. What more can you ask for? That is, until not too long ago, when I got a bit more than I asked for. When the COVID pandemic hit, there were a lot of people who lost their jobs. My firm was pretty much fine, as people needed to fix up their houses to make it through an entire year indoors. It was also a rising interest in custom furniture, so we got a lot of special orders. I felt kind of bad that we were doing so well, so I decided I wanted to do something to give back to the community. So for those people who lost their jobs, I decided to start a woodworking class. My wife loved the idea. I got to use the wood shop at a local high school after just a few short talks with the principal. I put up flyers around town, posted some ads on social media, and asked my daughters to spread the word in their class. We still made sure to adhere to safety standards, so there could only be 10 people at a time, and we were spread out far and wide. It took me less than a month to put it all together, and sooner than I realised, I was a teacher. It was easier than I thought it'd be, and as soon as I started talking about what I love, I was unstoppable. One by one, I asked my students what they wanted to make. Robert, an older man, wanted to make a pool cue. Donna, a stay-at-home mom, wanted to make a patterned rolling pin. Everyone had their own idea. Then, there was Roy. Roy was somewhere in his 40s. He was skinny, had a slight limp, and a face that just screamed that he'd been punched a few times too many. He had a surprisingly deep voice. Black hair, like a wet crow. So what do you want to make, Roy? I asked. Any ideas? What do you want? He asked. Me? I'd make a... He surprised me, but I thought about it. I tried to figure out something that a guy like Roy could make use of. I thought about a baseball bat, or something sporty, but he didn't seem like the type. I winged it. A shoehorn, I said. What do you think? Maybe, he nodded. A shoehorn. Or maybe a spice rack, I continued, weighing his reaction. Paint it something nice, something that matches your kitchen. Then I'll make a spice rack, said Roy. That's how our first class started. I went through the tools, and everyone was free to bring their materials over to the shop and make their project. They could also make them at home and come in for feedback. It was all very casual and free form. Most of them were excited, and I had a few talks about what tools to use, what to look for, and even what channels to check out online. We started making step-by-step -step plans to finish our project in time for our fifth and final lesson. During all this time, Roy didn't do anything. He didn't make any plans, he didn't make any sketches, he never asked any questions. He just stood there, nodding his head, rolling his R's. Sure, he was going to make a spice rack, he said, but he had nothing to show for it. Five sessions came and went, and everyone had something to present. Robert finished his pool cue, and Donna made an amazing star pattern for her rolling pin. Ray, on the other hand, had nothing. Didn't you finish your project, I asked. I did, he said. I just didn't bring it. We'd love to see it. It's okay if it isn't perfect. But it is, nodded Roy. It is perfect. Robert was clearly uncomfortable. Once my first group of students finished, the next batch signed up. A lot of younger folks this time, a majority under 18. And to my surprise, a returning student, Roy. While Julianne and Greg wanted to make a chessboard and a wall shelf, Roy didn't want to make anything. Instead, he just asked me again, what do you want to make? This time I said a ladder, a tool, something practical. Roy agreed. The weeks passed, one after another, and the same thing happened. 
Roy kept showing up empty-handed, while the other students just looked at him funny. Greg made a shelf from solid oak, and Julianne made her chessboard from birch. Roy, on the other hand, just listened to my instructions and took notes. He really seemed like he wanted to make something, but he just never did. As I started my third batch of students, Roy came along for the third time. Again, he asked, what do you want to make? At this point, I was frustrated. I'd make a tool shed, Roy, I said, to put all my other projects in. He looked up with a smile and nodded. I could have said spaceship, he still would have agreed. The other students noticed something was up, and two of them didn't come to the second session. Two more dropped out by the third. By the end of the final session, it was just me, Roy, and three people who had nothing to show. They were eager to leave, and I didn't feel like stopping them. Finally, there was only me and Roy left as I cleaned up. As I put away the sign-up sheets, he sat across from me with a big smile on his face. I finished it, he said. Finished what? The tool shed. Right. Is that where you keep the spice rack and ladder? Yes. I laughed, but he didn't. I waited for him to tell me that it was a joke, but he was dead serious. He stayed silent, watching me. You're serious, I said. You actually made it, didn't you? Yes, he nodded. Want to go see? I don't think so, Roy. No offence, but I'm not sure we're that close. Okay, he said. As casually as picking up a pack of gum, he suddenly pointed a gun at me. I want you to see. I need feedback. It's a strange feeling, being so casually threatened. You don't realise the danger at first. Mortality is just this fleeting, abstract concept until you stare down the barrel of a loaded handgun. Suddenly, you remember that you can die. We took my 68 charger. Roy was slightly larger than I thought, and he had to lean back in the passenger seat to fit his legs. Even without pointing the gun at me, I could almost feel it, like a heat radiating towards me. Roy seemed overall pretty calm about the whole thing, but my mind was racing. What was I supposed to do? Ram the car into a tree? I couldn't decide. And before I knew it, we'd been on the road for over an hour. Roy pointed at an exit and told me to follow a dirt road. I could feel my phone buzzing like crazy. My family was getting worried. He still hadn't asked me to turn it off. Maybe they would track me. The road just seemed to go further and further downward. I had to crawl at a slow pace just to spare the suspension. After about 20 minutes, there were more roots and boulders than the actual road. The phone stopped buzzing. We were off the grid. I parked the car and stepped out at Roy's instruction. Using a small flashlight, he showed me the way forward. We were deep in the forest, but I could barely hear a single bird. A few chickadees at most. My sister gets me the materials. She's very resourceful. I peeked behind me, only to see the gun pointed straight at me. Eyes forward, he said. I want your honest first impression. I could have sworn his eyes were red. At first, I didn't notice the clearing in the woods. There was a strange metallic smell in the air, strong enough for me to taste it. Still, no birds, no insects, just a breeze sweeping through the trees. There, said Roy, my tool shed. The flashlight fell upon something. It looked nothing like a tool shed. In many ways, it looked like nothing I'd ever seen before. Something started boiling up inside of me. Is... is that... that's not wood? No, said Roy, it isn't. I had to look away, but I felt the gun push me forward. Look! I looked. Bones, sinew, muscle and cartilage. A big, grotesque, hollow square... Every single detail was a nightmare in itself. The skin draped over the door was the last straw for me, and I fell to my knees, covering my face with my hands. Again, the cold steel of a gun pushed against me. I need you to look at two more things. Oh God, the spice rack, the ladder. Stepping into that tool shed, 
was like walking into hell. Most of the materials were dry, and there wasn't a single insect anywhere near. With nothing but Roy's flashlight, I only caught quick glimpses of the interior. I tried looking away, but the presence of that gun was enough to force my eyes forward. There, the spice rack, he said. Please, I... I saw rows of bony fingers, arranged like they were holding cups. Femurs arranged like a ladder. I blinked and turned around to plead for my sanity. Roy wasn't himself anymore. He was at least a foot taller, and his hair had grown longer. He smiled with anticipation, his eyes reflecting a clear shade of red. Small white fragments poked out of his hairline, like pin feathers of a bird, or sharp nails. His fingers seemed longer. You're useless, he growled. This was a mistake. I had to think of something. Say something, anything. The shoehorn, I gasped. What shoehorn? The first day, I said a shoehorn or a spice rack. Did, did you ever make the shoehorn? I could. Then, then show me. In an instant, he grabbed my arm, pushed me to the ground, and placed his knee on my back. He was going to break my arm. The realisation hit me like a bucket of ice. He was going to make a shoehorn out of my shoulder blade. Wood, you need to make it out of wood, I pleaded. That's the rule. I make the rules, he grinned. You're, you're so used to a single material. A, a tr true craftsman needs to be able to work a variety of, of materials. Birch, pine, oak, willow, all kinds. I can make things you can only dream of. He bent my arm further, like he was trying to snap a carrot. Then do it, make one. Pine wood, there's plenty of it to go around. He stopped. With a sigh, he let go and stepped off of me. Fine, he moaned. Wait here. He pushed me into the shed and closed the door. I fell to the floor in complete darkness. It was like a nest covered in branches, mud and grass. In fact, it smelled more like mud and grass than anything else. I couldn't help but wonder how something so grotesque could be almost completely without smell. It should have stunk like hell in there, but it didn't. A faint whiff of iron. That was it. The first thing I tried was my phone, but it was no help. There was no reception, and the light did nothing but to bring my nightmares to life. I couldn't stand to see my surroundings, but feeling the walls blindly didn't help either. I couldn't see any weak spots, but I couldn't feel either. I was stuck. This door was locked. I don't even know how, but I couldn't budge it. The entire shed was sturdy, using some sort of spine dug into the ground as support. I tried feeling my way out in the dark, but all it did was give me an inner picture of what I was actually standing in. After a while, it got so dark that I didn't know if I was closing my eyes or not. I lost track of the door. It all just felt wrong. How can you differentiate a door from a wall when all you can see and feel is dry meat and bone? I tried everything. Putting support on my back, I sat down and tried kicking to find weak spots. I tried the ceiling. I tried lifting, wedging and leverage. Nothing. The shed wouldn't budge. It felt like I struggled for an eternity, but it had possibly just been an hour. Light or no lights, I couldn't get out. My phone just sat there in my hands, useless. I felt it in my chest, that black, sinking anxiety. The cold. The feeling when you think you're about to die. I must have sat there frozen for hours. I snapped to attention when I heard a sound outside. It was a smaller, careful, and tiny steps. Hello? Anyone there? I called out with a dry voice. And? It was just a boy. Just some boy in the middle of nowhere. And all he had to say was, and. I pushed the confusion away, feeling a hope light up. Hey, hey kid, I smiled. You out there? Can you open the door? And then? I paused to think. What the hell was this? And, and then we can go pl go play. You want ice cream? We can get that. We uh, we can get whatever you want. Pizza. And then, 
I was about to explode on this kid. He had this infuriating tone like he was mocking me. Then suddenly, the door opened. He had the same dark hair as Roy, but was no more than 10 to 13 years old. The same red eyes, the same pale complexion. He was dragging some sort of blue plastic garbage bag. And then, he asked again, I don't, I don't know what you want. What? I... I looked around. The coast was clear. I couldn't leave him there. I tried picking him up, but he recoiled. He shook his head and stepped away. And then, he said, and then, we have to go, I whispered. Come on. And then, he said, matter-of-factly. He stepped inside the shed and closed the door. I just started running. My car wasn't far off, and I was far quicker on the way back than I'd been getting there. The keys were still in the ignition. The charger seemed just as eager to get me out of the woods as I'd been getting out of that shed. Together, we turned around and drove like maniacs back to the main road. I didn't care about the boulders, roots, vines or bushes. I had to go, and I had to go now. With a beaten suspension, we managed to get to the main road. I stepped on the gas. I'd rather die in a car crash than anywhere near Roy and his creations. What happened next was a blur. I was pulled over by a highway patrol who I noticed was in shock. I gave a statement about a kidnapping, trying to explain what I'd seen just made the deputy shake his head. Maybe he didn't believe me, or maybe he'd heard this before. Either way, he made very few notes, barely took my name. I've since shut down that class and I've been treated for a stress disorder. I get these stomach cramps and I have to sleep with the lights on. I have to see that I'm out of that hellhole with my own eyes. When the light disappears, I can't be sure anymore. I'm going to see a therapist about it soon enough. I've gotten a few recommendations. I'm not sure if I like the idea of overexposure therapy, but whatever works. I haven't heard anything about an investigation, but there have been no reports of murders nearby. Not to the extent that you could build a shed out of the remains, or a spice rack, or a ladder. Wherever Roy got his materials, it must have been from somewhere else. Maybe that kid knew. I think about him a lot. I get the feeling that he wasn't there to rescue me, so much as to just put away that plastic bag of his. But Roy is still out there. That, I'm certain of. After all, he sent me a shoehorn in the mail a few weeks ago. At least the damn thing was made out of solid pine. Not too long ago, a friend sent me up with a blind date. A handsome guy, but he probably spent more time on his hair than I did. He seemed pleasant enough, so I introduced myself and sat down next to him. He laughed and shook his head. I pictured you differently, he admitted. I mean, you're beautiful, but I thought you'd be... Strawberry blonde, I interrupted. A bit shorter, freckled with deep dimple cheeks. He stopped laughing, but kept a frozen smile. He didn't know what to say. I just stared at him. I knew this was going to happen, so why did I ever think this time to be different? Was that it I pushed? Was that what you pictured? I didn't even notice that I'd raised my voice. The date was already over as I started screaming at him. Was that what you goddamn pictured? I'd already screwed up. At that point, all I could do was lean into it. Let me explain. This has been the story of my life. People remember me wrong. They picture me wrong. Even my own parents could swear that I used to be strawberry blonde as a kid. There isn't a single picture of me with that hair colour. I don't have freckles or deep dimples that make my cheeks puff up. I'm tall with ink black hair. I got my Mediterranean features from my Italian mom. And that doesn't allow for a lot of cutesy freckles. Still, every person I've read remembers me that way. Sometimes, when we haven't met for a while, they barely recognise me. One of the most common questions I get is whether or not I've done something with my hair. It's really frustrating whenever I have to show my ID, as people just seem hesitant to accept the way I look to be the real me. 
And yes, I've tried leaning into it, changing my hair colour, even putting on freckles with a makeup pen. It doesn't help. It still just looks kind of off. The weird thing is, sometimes I even trick myself. Some mornings, I don't recognise my mirror image. For a split second, like a bump in the night, I'm staring at a stranger. I've talked to a therapist about the possibility of having some sort of depersonalization disorder, but that just isn't it. The problem isn't just me not recognising myself. It's no one else recognising me either. This is why I've come to an uncomfortable conclusion. Maybe I was supposed to be someone else. This has been my reality for as long as I can remember. Every date, every party, every picture day at school. Every single time someone asks me what I've done with my hair, or that they like my new makeup, all these little hints and pokes, it adds up over time. Maybe you can see why I'm a bit sensitive and might lash out at, say, a blind date. But something strange happened that one night. As I stormed off, I took a long walk by the downtown park area. There were a lot of people out and about, but I was all up in my head about overreacting. I thought about ways I could have handled it differently, or that I just had to, I don't know, start and taking some kind of medication. Any kind, whatever kind stops this. That's when I first noticed Daniel. It was a strange feeling. He was standing outside of a taco truck, talking to a group of friends. He didn't seem to stand out in any particular way, but I couldn't take my eyes off of him. He had this strawberry blonde hair, pale skin and freckles, deep dimples that made his cheek look bigger. He was shorter than his friends, but he just radiated this joy. I can't explain it. It feels like I could probably draw it as a picture, but I can't explain it with words. I had to talk to him. I walked up to him, past his friends, and tapped him on the shoulder. As he turned around, my mind cramped. He wasn't strawberry blonde, freckled, dimpled, or pale. He was Korean, sort of lumpy looking, and in complete shock. So were his friends. Still, he looked at me like he'd recognised me. There was something there, and neither of us could say what it was. We both laughed. How did you... We said it at the same time, mirroring each other's expressions. We both laughed again. Did you see, again, at the same time? His friends were laughing now as well. Jinx, they yelled at us. Jinx, Jinx. I had a long conversation with Daniel that night and we got to know each other. Turns out we were both born on the same day, but that was where our similarities ended. We'd gone to completely different schools in different parts of the country. And we both had the same problem. People mistook us for someone else. Remembering was wrong. It was even more abrupt for him, not even matching the body shape of the image people thought he was. His friends eventually grew tired of us and left. Daniel and I sat there in the park, talking long into the night. We complained about the way people talked about us, how we never really felt like someone saw us. How this weird, stupid quirk was the one defining thing about what it meant to be us. When we finally parted ways, we became friends and promised to speak again. We did. A lot. Over the next few weeks, we talked every day. I couldn't help myself still mentally picturing him as someone else, like a brain teaser. I thought about him as this thin, pale man with the same features that people thought I had. It bothered me, but this was exciting. I'd never met anyone with the same problem as myself, and all of a sudden, it felt like maybe there wasn't that much wrong with me after all. Then, the dreams came. I've always had lively dreams. I'm a very tactile person, so I remember the touch of something before I think of what it looks like. In the night, I could sometimes feel things that I'd swore I'd never felt before. Holding someone's hand with a hand that isn't mine. Feeling a breeze through someone else's hair. Tasting someone else's breath in your mouth. And the smell of birch trees reaching in through their nose. Like I was a passenger in another body. It would only last short moments and would interrupt whatever other dream I had to the point that I'd wake up. 
often in a cold sweat, like my body was scared, even though my mind was calm. Daniel told me he experienced something similar. It was getting more intense. Ever since we met, whatever this problem was had been turned up to 11. We decided to meet and talk about it for real. We met at the park, not too far from the taco truck where I first saw him. He brought me a milkshake. At first, I didn't even see him. I was expecting the strawberry blonde man that occupied my mind, not whoever the stranger in front of me was. I shook the thought off of my head, thinking he probably felt the same. We should go for it, he said. Lean into it. See what happens. What do you mean? Like we do in our dreams. I just looked at him. At first, I couldn't connect those thoughts to the person I saw in front of me. The more I thought about it, it felt like I could see through him. Like what he showed wasn't real, but there was a realer part of him that I recognized. The part that we all thought we truly saw before the spell was broken. We raised our hands at the same time and held them against one another. For a split second, I was somewhere else. A meadow in a birch forest, late springtime. Morning dew was still setting on the blue sunflowers surrounding us. Standing next to someone I felt close to. Someone I felt safe with. A warm hand against mine. Like we'd had a thousand times before. And still that uneasy feeling. I was still on the park bench. I dropped my milkshake. Did you see that? Daniel asked. Yeah, I said. Yeah, I did. I think I know where that was, he said. I've been there. We got to his car and drove away, following a smaller dirt road out of the city. The one down by the Frog Lake. Instead of turning back onto the main road, he followed a smaller road to the log cabins. We were going off-road and still, I didn't mind. I felt safe. He knew this place better than me, and I had no idea why or how I would even know that. It was dark outside, but I knew he could get us there either way. We'd never been before. Not this, Daniel. And not this me, but the real us. The road came to an abrupt end and we got out. Daniel held my hand. There was an overgrown path in the forest leading us deeper into the woods. Pine trees gave way to birch. The space between the trees tickled winds into pushing against us. For a moment, I was back. That springtime morning, hand in hand, blue sunflowers, a symbol of things to come. We were siblings, and we were pure. Something touched my nose, and I snapped back to reality. A feather. Where did it even come from? I don't even want to know anymore, sighed Daniel. I really don't. I think we have to, I said. I know, he nodded, but still. Yeah, still. Someone wanted us to go there. We had been told it'd be fine, that everything would work out. Someone had told us a lie, but I didn't know who or why. There, in the dark of the birch woods, I saw the outlines of sunflowers next to the overgrown path. What we were remembering was old, but no less real. My body was itching, telling me to stop. The milkshake wasn't settling in my stomach. All this had ever been was a mild inconvenience, and now it was literally controlling my life but at least I wasn't alone, and I could feel something coming. Truth, perhaps. Harsh truth. We knew the meadow was just around the bend, but were no less awed when it came. The sky seemed more open, the sun we were remembering was replaced by a moon, and the white clouds had turned black. This was the place. This is where we'd been. For a moment, I didn't see Daniel, I saw my brother smiling at me, talking to me, words reaching out to me like spoken underwater. I believe. I didn't even notice him saying it out loud. The real him, the Daniel I'd gotten to know over the past few weeks. What? I said. What did you say? I, I, I don't know, he admitted. I don't know why I said that. What? What else do you want to say? 
We closed our eyes and spoke from a memory that wasn't our own. Songs eternal, I said. As before, as is now, as will be. Don't, don't say that. I opened my eyes. Daniel was holding back tears, his face shaking. Something bad happens, I feel it. We're doing something bad. I could feel it too, like something crawling up my throat. I watched another white feather dance in the wind, blowing through the meadow. Daniel nodded at me and took a deep breath. We have to keep going, he said, closing his eyes. I know. You're my kin. My soul is true. A sun gone black, a moon gone blue. I ask you, saviour, through and through, if not the three of us, then who? As before, I said. As is now, Daniel continued. Then, quiet. There was supposed to be a third person. There had been a third person that day. She knew what would happen to us. We were the next generation to meet him. And no amount of promised eternity could convince her to surrender. Instead, there was a knife. She felled my brother first, then me. A knife bound for our hearts. The song remained unsung, tainting the land and every living thing with them. A promise unkept, potential unraveled. A part cloud, revealing the eye of a vengeful beast. Every bird in the meadow bursting open at the seams, their fathers falling like snow. I was there that day, watching my brother bleed out in the dried glass. The sun eclipsed in black, our spilled blood burrowing into the ground, tainting it for generations. A dark pool puddling deep in the soil, cursing our cowardice. We could have been beautiful, all three of us. The sky had gone dark as the clouds hid the moon. Daniel screamed, only to suddenly stop. Part of me knew what was to come. There was a third person in that meadow, and they just killed Daniel. I couldn't see anything, but I had to run. I tripped on a rotting log and stepped into an anthill. The grass was so dry that I could hear the footsteps of someone approaching. Daniel was wheezing for air and then stopped. I'd heard it once before. As will be, growled a third voice. As will fucking be. Had it been another second, they would have gotten me. A memory of their fingertips grabbing my strawberry blonde hair flashed before my mind. The imagined pain of a knife between my shoulder blades shot through me. The blameless coward was making up for past mistakes, but it had cost me my life. A part of me was screaming with joy, a deep, evil part of me, the part that laid dying with the real Daniel. The other part of was stepping me out of an anthill took off straight into the woods. It was a woman. She wasn't alone. Footsteps in the dark, joyous screams. People running, stumbling, falling and crying in the dark. A dozen of them at least. Some came close enough for me to hear their breath, but it was pitch black. I figured they'd hear me if I kept running, so instead... I'd laid down. I had next to a large rock. As the minutes passed, I heard them sweep the area, mistaking each other for me. Someone screamed in pain. Another screamed in joy. Someone was silenced by a crunching sound as teeth sunk into fletch. Madmen in the dark, whooping and shouting, begging for my death, for their release. Asking me to give up and die. I covered my ears and prayed for dawn. My pulse raced so fast I could barely hear the individual beats anymore. I held my breath until I almost passed out. It felt like an eternity, but my panicked lizard mind refused to let me out of that moment. I couldn't even count the seconds. I just waited, moment by moment, for the nightmare to end. In an instant, or an eternity, came dawn. It worked. I don't know how, but it did. I had twisted my ankle without even noticing, but come the dawn, I could barely walk. 
There was still morning dew in the air and a couple of blue sunflowers looked my way. I found no trace of Daniel's body and when I called the police, there wasn't much they could do. They did ask me many questions about the supposed third person and there was plenty of physical evidence for a group of people in the area, but nothing to fin it. People rarely fish down at Frog Lake anymore and most people who live in that area are weird loners. This far into the woods, no one can hear you scream. We'd be combing the forest for days without finding a speck of blood. The investigation is kept under wraps. No one has talked to me about it and no one seems to be asking about Daniel anymore. And me? Well, people don't mistake me for that strawberry blonde girl anymore. I think she died in that field next to her brother. Maybe now my life can truly be my own. I think I'll be okay. I need your help. I've been dating my girlfriend Daisy for three and a half years. I met her through a dating site. I found her rubber duck collection nothing short of amazing. And when I showed her a collection of my own, we pretty much started dating without having ever met. But of course, we met and hit it off quick. Seems like such a lifetime ago. Things between us got serious as we both agreed we'd start aiming for the next stage in life at the four year mark of our relationship. That means we're gonna get married and one year after that, start trying for a family. It's all because of this stupid agreement we made half jokingly on our first date. We'll date for a year or casual like she joked and then we'll be the cute couple for the second year, I added, just to annoy people. Then we'll move in, she nodded. That's our third year. Then we get married, year four. Kids, year five. It was this dumb inside joke and we've since planned every year up to our retirement. It morphed from a joke into a rough sketch of our lives together and we've held on to it pretty well. We did move in together last year and I've had plans to ask her to marry me on the day of our fourth year anniversary. But this is where it gets complicated. I don't think she'll accept my proposal and if that's the case, I believe she's going to die. We have to stay together. Let's take a step back. I'll try to explain. I'm half American and half Vietnamese. I was raised in Tomscock, Minnesota, just south of Fergus Falls, just north of St. Gaul. My parents were met when my mom was backpacking in Vietnam in her early 20s, and my dad just kind of went with it. He was her guide through the entire country, and when it was time for her to go home, she just kind of brought dad along. Fast forward a few years, my mom, Anita, was a nurse at the local high school, while my dad, Ving, got a job as a firefighter. I was their only childhood. I spent most of my summers near Bing Cho with my grandmother. She lived by a lake and would spend most of her days fishing, listening to the radio and cooking for the local restaurants at night. She cooked the best branded crate in the area and tourists were always asking her for speciality. Yes, branded crate is a snake. Yes, she'd kill them with her bare hands. Even as I stared down live snakes, I'd never even flinch. I was safe. Nana was a badass and she would protect me no matter what. She taught me a lot, but the one thing that stuck with me was a saying she held very dear. A fair face may hide a foul heart. It was her favorite saying. Every time something seemed too good to be true, she'd tap her nose and recite it in Vietnamese. Someone tried to sell you something suspiciously cheap? Tap the nose. Someone you don't know smiling at you from across the street? Tap the nose. No one would hurt her grandchild. No one. When I was 12, I spent my last summer in Bing Chow. Nana and I took the boat out. We were kind of fishing, but also kind of not. Her kind of fishing was just throwing in two rods and then falling half asleep with her face in a book. I'd adjusted. I usually brought a Game Boy out. She'd tolerate it as long as the sound was off or I plugged in my headphones. She even played a few times herself, 
even though she didn't understand how I could memorize the controls. She'd just fallen asleep with a magazine when it started to rain. She didn't notice, but I didn't want my Game Boy to break. I reached across the boat to put it under my jacket when I lost my balance. I fell overboard, Game Boy in hand. I must have hit my head on something on the way down, as I don't remember much of what happened afterwards. The rain got worse, and I remember Nana getting in the water to pull me up from under the surface. The world felt upside down, as if rain was pulled up from the lake. I vaguely remember her worried face looking down at me as I broke the water surface. As I laid on my back, rocked by the waves, I started to become aware of my surroundings. My mouth tasted like mud and seaweed. Raindrops were pushing into my eyes. Nana was gone. So were the oars and my Game Boy. All that remained was her magazine, wrinkled by the storm. I screamed for her to come back, but she was gone. We were too far out from the shore. I couldn't make it back to land. My head was pounding and my lungs hurt from coughing. I screamed and cried long into the night, but no one came. I was alone. I cried so hard my jaw hurt from the screaming, and as I curled into a fetal position, I cried myself to sleep. I could see her in my mind's eye, at the bottom of the lake, reaching out to me. I almost froze to death. I don't remember the fisherman finding me or taking me ashore. I don't remember the first two days in the hospital, or the doctor calling my parents. I barely remember my uncle coming out to see me. My first clear memory was on the plane back home, where I had a panic attack and locked myself in the bathroom. I never would have imagined the calm waters hiding such horror, but as Nana used to say, a fair face may hide a foul heart. I didn't leave Tomskog for years, not even for summer camp. My mom offered all kinds of places to go, as my dad tried to get me to visit his brother back in Vietnam. I just refused. All of it. I didn't want any more adventures or experiences. I just wanted to feel safe again. Even in the calmest moments of the day, I could find myself having a panic attack, always with a nagging voice telling me, a fair face may hide a foul heart. But being 12 turned to being 17. My attention turned from Game Boys to girls. I started dating Mary Ann. She was one year older than me and was planning to get a degree from DMU the following year. But knowing it was all going to end just kind of made it all more interesting. We spent a lot of time together that year and even considered trying long distance. To me, her sunny smile and brown hair was synonymous with summer love and I just wanted to feel that for as long as I could. In the end, we decided to break up. At least, she did. It wasn't a unanimous decision. I blocked her on every channel I could, just so I wouldn't feel the pain of losing her. I tried dating other people in the following years, but nothing compared to Mary Ann. Most of the women I met either tried to make me into something I wasn't, or were just using me, or I just didn't love them. Angela wanted to move in with me after a month, just to get out of paying rent for her own apartment. Jessie just wanted someone to cook for her. Maria was a perfectly kind and caring woman that I just couldn't love. I had a rough few years dating-wise, to say the least. The year I turned 21, my mom had a psychotic episode and died in the county jail. Long story, but it was the final nail in the coffin. I shut down, emotionally. I'm not the kind of guy who stays friends with my exes. We're exes for a reason, and there's too much history there for it not to be awkward. I can smile, wave, and exchange pleasantries, but I don't want to remain friends on Facebook, especially with Mary Ann. Years after breaking up, she still came to me in my dreams, her smile warming me with a glow of summer love. My life was pretty much a one-way street. I got a degree in building engineering from Concordia University, and went from an intern to a junior position at a large architecture firm. We mostly designed apartment buildings, but also the occasional novelty. 
restaurants mostly. We were working on sketches for the restoration of a large theme park recently, for the project for the park. Still, it was interesting work, even if I mostly got to do the grunt stuff. I was 26 when I first met Daisy online. A friend of mine had talked me into setting up an account on a dating site and, well, you know the rest. Marianne might have been my summer love, but the thought of Daisy it was what keeps me warm in the winter. All complaints and fights aside, I love her. I didn't think I could, but I do. But yeah, this is where it gets complicated. See, Marianne died. She died about a year after we broke up, in her dorm room at DMU. The details around her passing are sketchy, but a few things stand out. She had lake water in her lungs, and severe damage due to her main arteries. The coroner had ruled the cause of death to be cardiac arrest, but others speculated she'd been drowned and moved. Her roommate had found her. I'll never forget what she told the local newspaper. People don't just crawl into their beds and drown. I was rattled by it. I didn't want to bring it up with Daisy. She had a bit of a jealous streak. Instead, I just kept it to myself. Over the coming months, the distant dreams of summer love turned into a nightmare. The nightmare is always the same. I'm sitting on a bridge, watching a dark lake. Droplets rise from the waters, floating into the air in a slow reverse rain, tickling the underside of my bare feet as they pass me by. The lake reveals a mass of white stones buried in the muddy bottom. Then the stones start to move. A chill crawls up the back of my spine as I realise that the stones are a mass grave of chalk white bodies. Their limbs stretch and slouch like warm rubber. A sour smell stings my eyes. The bodies wriggle back and forth like maggots trying to get on top of one another. White Eyeless faces bump and grind. Elongated faces wrestling to stay on top. In the moments before I wake up, they look at me in unison, bend their mouths open so wide their necks snap, and they scream without a sound. On the bottom of the pile, I see Marianne's brown hair sink deeper into the mud. Their screams make my bones itch, and as I lean over to scratch my feet, I fall off the bridge head first. A hand brushes against my neck, trying to pull me back up, but it's too late. I have that nightmare at least once a week. Mary Ann's death disturbed me more than I thought, but I tried to keep up appearances. Over the coming weeks, I talked to her family and friends to find out more, and I co- uncovered something. Not only had Mary Ann died, that several of my exes had died. Angela, Jessie, Marla, all dead. Angela had been in a car crash. Jessie died on a flight to San Diego, locked in the bathroom. Marla was hit by a train. It was all mysterious circumstances, and looking closer at each one just makes it all weirder. They'd found seaweed on the passenger seat of Angela's car, Jessie had snake venom in her blood, and Marla? Well, she sent a cryptid text just before voluntarily stepping out in front of a train. Chai dim hoy. Foul heart. My nose itches as I read it. I've tried to push this all away, to just enjoy my time with Daisy. I've tried to ignore it all. I don't think this is all just a coincidence, and I think that somewhere... Somehow, that drained lake is real. The lake where all those dead bodies pile up. I believe that one day, that pile will grow, large enough for them to pull me up and down into the mud. I can hear the sound of wet flesh if I just listen closely. The noise feels like a tattoo on my brain. It's always there, no matter if I want to or not. I try to shut it out with music and laughter, but it's getting harder and harder to smile. But this is where I turn to you. 
two months ago. Daisy cheated on me. It wasn't full on sex, but it was touching and making out. She'd met an ex of hers when she was at a bachelorette party with her friends, and things had gotten out of hand. When I confronted her about it, she laid the blame on me, on me being distant and weird. She'd found my odd searches and wondered why I was spending so much time looking up my exes. Instead of a discussion about our commitment to one another, it turned into an accusation. Sure, she'd openly made out with an ex during a moment of weakness, but what the hell was I up to? I couldn't tell her even if I wanted to. She's not going to believe me. I felt myself slowly falling out of love, but I don't want Daisy to go away. She's still my winter's warmth. I don't want her to die, and I don't want to feel her thin fingertips curling around my ankles at that bridge. We have to stay together. I have to prove her heart not to be foul. We have to work through this, and I don't know what to do. I think Nana is trying to protect me, like she did all those years ago. I believe this is all her still trying to drag me onto the shore, away from the lake I was destined to drown in. I just don't know if she's causing it or trying to stop it. Things are getting urgent. I don't think there's much time. If Daisy leaves me, I don't know what will happen. I don't think she'd accept my proposal as things are today. Last Wednesday, as I got up to brush my teeth, I found something in the bathroom sink. An old Game Boy smelling of mud and seaweed. A lot of people don't seem to know the difference between an evolutionary biologist and a marine biologist. Sure, there's overlap, but you can't just exchange one for the other. As an evolutionary biologist, I've tried to explain this difference to my family for years. I can sort of understand how they can get it mixed up, but when it gets to working out there, in the real world, there really is no reason why an employer would confuse the two. The terms are not interchangeable. Therefore, I was skeptical when I was first asked to be involved with the Norwegian float project. The study was to be conducted entirely at sea, with the help of both the Icelandic and Norwegian governments. The entire project was government sanctioned, and everything was official and on the books. Which wasn't talked about was the project was actually about. From a time, there was even a website but the description was so generic that it was impossible to learn what was going on. Improving and understanding the life of a quickly changing ecosystem, said an important man in a fancy suit through a YouTube link on the front page. I have a saying, when something is so generic that it can be applied to everything, it doesn't mean anything. Let's take a step back. I'm a biologist, evolutionary biologist, specifically. I got everything up to my postdoc from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, Stockholm. I've worked with a variety of colleagues from all over the world. I published a paper with a fellow scientist on environmental impacts of electromagnetism in 2015, which I highly recommend reading. When I was asked to work for the Norwegian float back in 2017, I had just come back from a study in Iceland. I think this was what sparked their interest in my particular field of study, adoption in rapid temperature shifts. My speciality is working with fruit flies and stickleback fish. I've been working in the active volcanic areas of Iceland when our operation was suddenly defunded. To this day, I'm not sure why. I don't think it was a coincidence. This is when I was contacted by the Norwegian Float Project, or NF for short. They asked me to be a part of a project located far out at sea, despite me being an evolutionary biologist. Again, not a marine biologist. It was weird, but I needed the work. Our entire Iceland project had been axed overnight, and I was just sitting at the hotel watching my bank account drain. I barely asked any questions. I just brought my sticklebacks and climbed aboard. Science ain't cheap. This is what I knew about NF at that point. 
The entire operation was set at the northern edge of the Norwegian Sea, just north of Iceland. No less than four science vessels were active on site, with daily check-ins from the Coast Guard. We were working in four teams, isolated from one another, only communicating through approved daily reports that went through what my boss called a funnel. It was a fancy way of saying all communication between teams was monitored, rewritten and double-checked. Our vessel, the Heyerdahl, could hold a crew of about 12 people, with plenty of space to run samples. On my first day out there, I still had no idea what was going on. My colleagues, four Norwegian men and an Icelandic woman, tried to fill me in. It's hard for a landlubber like me to be out in the middle of the Norwegian sea like this. The waves can reach so high that you swear you're going to capsize. Nothing feels solid, and it can take days before you reach the point where you can feel the waves in your mind before you feel them in your legs. It dips into freezing temperatures at night, and the power necessary to keep climate control running is ridiculous. I can't imagine someone willingly staying out there for a prolonged period, and yet I signed up for four weeks. That was what started in my initial contract. We were assigned to work in pairs. I worked with the Icelandic woman, Selma. She was an actual marine biologist and was just as surprised to see me there as I was. She had little to no idea what was going on either. We had our first mission briefing, 36 hour after first stepping foot out on the Heyerdahl. We were sitting in this small cafeteria sized room. Everything there is metal. And if the ship rocks too much, it all starts screeching. A man I'd never seen before had set up a projector and our crew sat down to listen. Everyone was wearing thick jackets, caps and gloves, but most of us were still shuddering. The man with the projector wasn't. Do you know the term island biome was the first thing he asked us. Most of us nodded. An island biome is the term for an ecologic system that has been largely separated from other systems for a long period of time. Kind of like the Galapagos Islands, Darwin's Finches. We found an island biome and we need to study it. We need experts from a wide range of areas, so I imagine things will be a bit confusing as we start. Don't be afraid to air your concerns, but please be aware that we are just as confused as you are. He fired up the projector. The image made it clear. They'd found something over 13,000 feet into the sea. A few weeks earlier, there had been a tectonic shift. The NF project had been a standby government task force between the Norwegian and Iceland governments for years, just in case they needed to put together a team at short notice. They had been expecting something like this to happen eventually. Shortly after the shift, they noticed areas of the ocean being discolored through satellite imagery. Shortly afterwards, they found an isolated pocket far beneath the ocean's surface. This pocket of the ocean, at about 14,000 feet, has been isolated for millions of years. Now it was released into the ocean. An isolated island biome is suddenly introduced to the Norwegian Sea. The reason for the ocean to turn black in the area was nothing short of microbes. Imagine the number of microbes necessary to colour the ocean for several square miles. We were shown a series of images. Thick slabs of goo, almost like oil, slapping against the hull of the Heyerdahl. The man with the projector told us we would be allowed to study this in person and that samples were already being provided. Further samples would be gathered at the request of the team. The implications of this were unfathomable. What kind of life forms have evolved to survive at those crushing depths? I'm not gonna lie, I was excited to get started. So were my colleagues. We were issued some standard safety equipment and briefed on basic protocols. The project was fairly secret as to avoid potentially damaging traffic. We had to surrender our personal cell phones to two men armed with pistols. That first night, we were given some initial samples. 
My colleagues were ecstatic, and most of the night we were up throwing around names for new species. At least 13 unknown kinds were identified, but that first night, we were surprised to see that most of the microbes were fungi, as opposed to the expected algae. Mushrooms at the bottom of the sea? Who would have known? The first few days were amazing. Our reports were smoothly rolling between our four teams, and we'd identified at least 37 different types of fungi in the waters. By this time, we were getting ready to send down deep sea cameras and diving teams. We were still pretty excited about the entire event, and even the armed guards didn't seem so frightening to us. They were good guys just trying to do their job after all. They had no reason to be unpleasant. We all ate together in the cafeteria every day. Lots of salted fish and crisp bread, as per Scandinavian tradition. My favourite guard, Hellman, made amazing mayonnaise and tuna sandwiches for us. At the end of the first week, we were getting some strange reports. Most of the fungus we'd been testing had a mineral in common that we were unable to identify. We tried to extract it, and in a few days we had three grams of a completely unknown metal sitting in our lab. Our boss was beyond excited. The third team had a geologist who was unable to even take a guess at what kind of metal we were looking at. It was almost like a crystalline structure, but more similar to lead. We were promised an expert would look into it in a couple of days. We still had our heads spinning with daily discoveries. We even discovered larger life forms like fish. Still, they were smaller than the nail on your pinky finger, but they were actual complex life forms. Completely black pellet shaped and eyeless. These fish, just as the fungus, had large traces of the unknown metal embedded in their scales. Our superiors gave it the name of blameless metal, claiming with a shrug that it was as good as name as any. After all, it wasn't the metal's fault that it had surfaced. It was blameless, see? We found it kind of funny. You have to remember, we thought we were standing at the edge of the discovery of a century. We had a pretty bright headspace at the time. After two weeks, we were all pretty used to working on the higher doll. We all knew each other by name, and we had strict routines that we followed. The expert had arrived and was working with team two, but initial tests were inconclusive. The only thing we knew for sure was that the blameless was a previously undiscovered kind of metal that most of the life forms had evolved to gain nourishment from. Selma and I were working on testing the effect of the fungus environment on my sickleback fish, the other teams were using divers to gain less pressure damaged samples. There was also a deep sea camera being set up, but we were having trouble finding relevant data. Every day, the microbes were diluted, and the massive amounts of moving water would start to drift us further and further away from the point of origin. Soon, we were split up into two teams with two vessels each. Those following the microbe migration down the current, and those of us who stayed at the origin state. Selma theorized that a particular set of fungus was formed by how deep the isolation biome stretched, as the fungus closer to the ceiling of the bubble was smaller than the larger fungus that lived deeper down. Essentially, it allowed us to gain a sense of how large the pocket really was. Selma ballparked that it was about 2,000 to 2.5 meters in depth, depending on size variation. Still, the crown of our discovery was by far the unidentified metal. At the start of my fourth week, I started to see a troubling change in my sticklebacks. I noticed there were fewer of them, and that the water was growing darker despite having a functioning filter. Their behavior changed. They would start swimming in circular patterns around one of the larger females who would eat them alive. She grew to be more than three times the size of the other sticklebacks, and in two days, she was the only living fish left in the tank. The dark colour of the aquarium came from rapidly multiplying fungus. A lack of pressure didn't seem to be an issue. I reported this to our superiors and asked them to do further testing on how fast this fungus could spread and whether it was a vast difference when treated with fresh, salt or brackish water. Selma agreed that it was important and she was starting to grow worried. However, it was made clear that our main focus should be metal. Apparently, Team 2 
had found that it was extremely reflective. They had managed to gain enough to make a small cube of it, and the thing reflected so much light that it would damage your eyes during prolonged contact. It would also gain enough heat to start a small fire. It was extremely conductive, far surpassing gold and copper. With this potential game changer at hand, my sticklebacks weren't the focus of the Norwegian governments anymore. Selma, on the other hand, was anxious. While she took on the responsibility of doing whatever tests management asked us to do, I was free to keep experimenting on the sticklebacks and their reaction to the fungus. One morning, when I got to the lab, the big stickleback female was nowhere to be seen. The lid of the small aquarium had been pushed aside and a black slime trail had been left on the floor. I found Kroger wiggling halfway across the room, straight towards my other sticklebacks in the control tank. We decided enough was enough and killed it. That's when we discovered a few troubling features during the autopsy. Krager had lost both her eyes, and the bones had deteriorated to a sort of black mush. The entire physiology of the fish was getting replaced by something jelly-like. The concentration of the metal was higher, especially in the brain. Selma flagged in her report that we needed to take increased security measures and that the fungus could be dangerous when inhaled. Management didn't listen, but we started wearing gas masks from that point on. Many of my colleagues followed suit voluntarily. This was only the start of our troubles. The diving teams reported getting burns as if stung by jellyfish straight through their diving suits. We were told about long lightning-like burns on their torsos, arms and thighs. One of them had apparently been so harshly burned that they had gone, gone into anaphylactic shock. They had to be immediately returned to the surface, risking decompression sickness. We were not told about this in any of the reports, but by the guards who we'd gotten to know by now. Hellman was just as worried as we were. But everything went to shit when by week six, it started raining. It was a cold morning in early April when the rains came and it was immediately obvious that something wasn't right. The water drops were thick and almost the size of golf balls. Some of them fell so hard and fast that there were cracks in the glass of the main bridge. We were ordered inside, but Selma managed to get a few samples. The management was duct taping towels to the glass, trying to cover it up. It was the same fungus that we'd studied, but slightly refined. The fungus had tagged along the evaporating ocean water and became a part of the rain formation cycle. This happens to some degree in nature all the time, but I'd never seen anything like it. It was far too aggressive. The clouds were solid black. Drops weren't just falling, they were dripping, forming a pore like texture on the black clouds. The sky looked like a big hairy creature with drops falling from hair like tendrils. For a moment, it felt like the end of the world. Nothing has ever made me feel so small, so insignificant. The guards were having trouble getting their uniforms off. The droplets were so thick and quickly hardened, turning it into a slime-like substance. Niles, one of my colleagues, was starting to complain about a stinging like salt sensation in his eyes. Think, thinking back on what happened to Krager, I was getting a bad feeling. It all went to hell quickly. Niles locked himself in the bathroom, vomiting. One of the guards, Hellman, stripped naked and started scratching his skin with an army knife. Selma and I tried to get into our safety equipment, but there was no time. Three of our colleagues got there first, and one of the guards started waving his pistol around. Things were about to go bad, so we just stepped out. We wrapped ourselves in ponchos and hurried up on deck. The drops were so big that I was stuck to the gand. Selma helped me up, but stepped away as she saw my hands covered in black. Trying to walk on the upper decks was like sliding back and forth in wet mud. We also noticed the boat wasn't rocking as much as usual. The ocean surface had turned a bit more solid. We got to the main bridge, but were locked out. They refused to let us in. And when we were being insistent, they started threatening us. They assured us they would use force to keep us out if necessary. We abandoned the idea and ran across to the rescue boats, pulled the plastic tarp over us 
and try to wait it all out. After a few hours, the clouds covered the sky. It was barely 11 a.m. and it was completely black outside. Selma and I stayed quiet, hearing the thick smatter of droplets on the plastic tarp. We could hear screams coming from the main deck. Selma peeked out at one point, but quickly looked away. There's something in the water, she whispered. I peeked out, but could only catch a glimpse before Selma pulled me away. There were thousands of them. Endless fairy lights just beneath the mucus surface of the ocean. I'm sure it was the reflective metal reacting to our warning lights, bouncing off of thousands of life forms. By 1pm, we heard gunshots. We hid under the tarp, but could hear the scene playing out. Someone was running out the main deck followed by at least six other people. While Samuel was looking away, I peeked out. I could see Hellman standing at the front of the main deck. He was naked and bleeding, holding a gun out towards five of our colleagues. In the front was Niles. His face turned completely black. I couldn't see his eyes. Stay back, Hellman screamed. Get back inside. They didn't stay back. Instead, they reached for him, groaning. Kill me, they begged. Eat me. As they grabbed Hellman, he started firing blindly. I covered my head and ears, just waiting for it all to be over. For at least half an hour, there were guttural screams. People begging, pleading, screaming for Hellman to kill them. Kill them and eat them. People crying, screaming and trying to force themselves into his mouth. What worries me is that I heard at the end before things went quiet. They were no longer begging and crying. They were thanking him. Then nothing. A few hours passed. We could hear helicopters and the drops stopped falling on our tarp. You have no idea how loud a helicopter really is until you're standing right below one. They're deafening. Selma and I were given blindfolds and carried out to a nearby Coast Guard boat. People were screaming in Icelandic but I could barely hear it over the helicopters. As we were getting further and further away from the site, I slowly realized that Selma and I had been separated. I'd had my blindfold on for close to eight hours when I was pushed into a decontamination room. My clothes were cut off with scissors and I was sprayed with freezing water and antiseptics. I could have sworn it was pure chlorine. They shaved my head. They took blood tests and I was forced to blow through some kind of a tube, like a sobriety test. They also tapped my teeth with some sort of tiny hammer. I was in quarantine for a week. It wasn't bad, just a small room and no human contact. No internet, but pretty much anything I could ask for otherwise. I spent that week reading and writing down my thoughts. Pretty much everything I wrote down was confiscated by the end of the week, and I was forced to sign an agreement not to talk about it. I'm thinking, you know, to hell with it. What the hell is Iceland going to do about it? I've been completely disconnected from the Norwegian float project since, but it's still up and running. I've heard reports about black spots appearing along the ocean current, and I suspect the fungus is migrating. The northern coast of Ireland was briefly evacuated following the resurgence of one of these black spots, but they claim it was for seismologic reasons. Bullshit. Didn't see any papers mentioning the apparent mass suicides. I've seen videos of people freaking out the same way the crew of the Hyredal did, begging to be killed and eaten. It seems to be a recurring pattern, and I've seen it triggered in all manner of strange ways. The weirdest thing I've seen was some sort of triggering the same effect in people. Also, one of my colleagues seems to have had something that seems eerily similar to the blameless metal we found. Small world, isn't it? It's the same person I worked with on my article about electromagnetism back in 2015. I think the NF project has tried to contain this thing. There was a period when there were barely any black spots at all during most of 2018-19. But all of a sudden, they just started popping up out of nowhere. They're still out there. You can find them on Google Maps even. It wasn't just Brexit that screwed with commercial fishing in the UK. Let's just leave it at that. It started off the coast of Norway and Iceland, but there were black spots appearing as far away as Ireland and the UK. By my predictions, and following the migration patterns, the next few spots will start to appear outside the coast of Newfoundland, 
and the Gulf of St. Lawrence in late 2021. I don't even want to think what the Krieger human will look like, but from my calculations, it could be a monstrosity as tall as 20 feet. That's just a rough estimate based on the little time I have to study these things. Look for the black spots. Look for the symptoms. They make you beg and squirm. They make you want to be eaten.